Thank you very much to the Tan family worship team. I trust you had a great time worshiping together with us. And I think you will notice that some, somewhere along the line when we were singing, we had uh, uh, the moss joining us. So, but that's okay. Uh, I'm so glad that you, you can join us today. Yeah? And uh, we want to just have a word of prayer before we begin uh, sharing the scriptures, all right? Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank, uh, th th this morning, we thank you that, Lord, your presence has been here with us. We thank you that we can worship you and tell you we want to love you with all our hearts. So, Father, we just give you praise and honor and bless the word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's all settle down for the Word of God this morning, and uh, we are talking about Psalms 46 today, yeah? Psalms 46, God is our refuge, uh, God our strength. And uh, I want to be able through this Psalms to uh, uh, help us be able to uh, grasp uh, God's goodness and His grace for us, and how he actually protects us and keeps us, all right? Uh, and we need to know how to make that a reality in our life. So, uh, this morning, our objective is really to go on Psalms 46 and uh, share how... All right, this morning, we just want to share the message objective. Uh, today's message from Psalm 46 is titled, God our refuge and God our strength. Now, I want us to be able to understand that there are many promises of the scripture, but uh, often they remain in our heads. But this particular psalm has tremendous promise for us. But at the same time, it also outlines to us the way in which we can make uh, something in our head drop six inches down to our heart so that we know it with all our heart. So to, uh, this, uh, this morning, we want to just look at, uh, there are four things in this psalm, very quickly. There is the declaration of faith. Number two, there is the joy of the spirit. Number three, the stability from spiritual sight and the power of Selah. Let me just, uh, before I do this part, let me just remind you, for the last two Sundays, we we're talking about receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And uh, at the last part of it is that our God is a consuming fire. So today, I want to bring a scripture for you to look at. No? And this scripture is about an unshakable kingdom that we are in. But I want you to note that this is about sinners in Zion. Now, Zion represents what? We know scripture says Zion represents uh, the city of the living God, the new Jerusalem uh, that we have come into. So, why are there sinners in Zion? Interesting, isn't it? The scripture says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? See, the scripture in Hebrews end with the fact that God is a consuming fire. And here is a warning to us. We can be in the kingdom of God and there are things in our life that God wants to burn up. And there are, uh, there's a possibility for us to be sinners in Zion. All right? And uh, the scripture says here, if we live among a God of consuming fire, then the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites and he asked the question, who among us can dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? So that's the uh, kingdom we have. Now the next, it continues to say, who can dwell 
in the midst of a consuming fire. And that is you and I, need to, we need to take note of this because uh, we can be in Zion and be hypocritical in our life. That means not doing the right things. And here the scripture says, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hand, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from the hearing of bloodshed and shut his eyes from seeing evil. These are the kind of people who can dwell in the midst of consuming fire. The one who walks righteously. I put the New Living Translation for you, for, particularly for the last two lines, because it's a little bit difficult to understand. Where he says, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, who shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Uh, scripture is not saying, see no evil, hear no evil. All right, And that means you don't bother about bloodshed, you don't bother about evil. The actual translation, the meaning in New Living Translation is those who refuse to listen to those who plot murder and those who shut their eyes to all enticement to do wrong. So these are the people who will dwell in the unshakable kingdom of God amongst the God who is a consuming fire. And then he ends up by saying, this is what we are like, unshakable in the kingdom of God. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him, his water will be sure. When the earth is being shaken and all the things that are not of God is being shaken out, if you are living a hypocritical life, God will shake that out and make you one who will live in righteousness. And I want to speak to you, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we still live in, uh, in a compromising uh, a way in our, in our life as a Christian. We, we continue to do things that are evil, but God wants to shake it out. Because if you want to be unshakable in the kingdom of God, this is the kind of person you want to be. And when you're unshakable, you will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him. His water will be sure. In other words, in the unshakable kingdom of God, when everything around us seems to collapse, you are be, you're going to be certain of your food, your security, your provision. God's going to take care of you. That's just to start off uh, with to continue on the theme of the shaking of the kingdom of God. Now, Psalms 46 verses 1 to 3. And uh, before we go and show you the scripture, uh, let me just tell it to you, okay? It says that God, Psalms 46 verse 1 to 3 says, God is our refuge, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried away into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. That's the verse from verses 1 to 3. Okay? So we want to explore it. And the first section, the first point I want you to learn from Psalms 46 is really that uh, we need to understand the power of the declaration of faith. If we're going to live in the security of God, we need to be able to declare with a declaration of faith that God is our refuge and strength as a very present help in time in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. So, how do we make something, a promise of God, become real in our life? How do we, how do we uh, not only just read scripture and understand what God promises for us, how do we make it something that belongs to us? And I want to say to you, the first thing all of us have to do is to learn how to make declarations. Every morning, some of us need to, especially if we are fearful and shaken, some of us need to make declarations from Psalms 91. With the confidence of faith. And even this uh, uh, chapter 46 of Psalms. Do you know when uh, uh, Luther, this is a favorite, uh, there is a hymn based on that. And Luther loves this hymn. Every time he meets a challenge in life, he will tell his people, come let us sing from Psalms 46. So the importance of declaration, the importance of declaring our faith. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. And therefore, we will not fear. 
So may I encourage you, brothers and sisters, every morning, take the psalm and uh, the first part of it. Declare this, this declaration of faith. The first thing is to declare in faith the promises that God has given to us. Declaration that God is our refuge and our strength, and He is a very present help in trouble. So therefore, we will not fear. When fear overtakes you, when fear causes your heart to fail you, declare the way to overcome fear is to declare. Declare it with all our hearts and all our mind, all right? And the subsequent verse we have read just now is that even though the earth be removed, now, after saying, okay, God is our refuge and our strength and a very present help in trouble and therefore we will not fear, the next two verses actually describe a very fearsome thing, all right? What's the fearsome thing? Even though the earth be removed, all right, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with swelling. So, here's a contrast. The declaration of faith tells us we will not fear. But the scripture continues to tell us of situations that can be so frightening and awesome. But how do we remain without fear in the midst of shakings, in the midst of the earth moving, in the midst of mountains being cast into the midst of the sea, in the midst of the sea's waves just roaring and being troubled, in the midst of even mountains shaking because of the swelling of the sea? So, uh, as a matter of uh, 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 interest for you, uh, I have... Given, I want you to watch this little video and see how awesome, how awesome this event that scripture talks about. I think the volume needs to be a bit louder. Tsunamis are one of the worst forms of natural disasters. As an example, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which had waves as high as 30 meters tall once heading inland, killed approximately 230,000 people in 14 separate countries, making it one of the worst natural disasters ever in recorded history. Tsunamis, unlike normal waves, which are caused by the winds and tides by the gravitational pull of the moon, are caused by extremely large displacements of water. In the case of the Indian Ocean tsunami, it was caused by a large undersea megathrust earthquake that measured 9.2 in magnitude. This earthquake occurred along a 1600 kilometer subduction zone where the Indian plate slid under the overriding Burma plate. As the overriding Burma plate bulged under strain, tectonic uplift occurred before eventually the plate slipped causing a massive amount of energy to be released and thus causing a tsunami. This earthquake, which displaced an estimated 30 cubic kilometers of water, created waves with an energy equivalent of 5 megatons of TNT, which is more than twice the total explosive energy used during all of World War II. On average, two tsunamis occur per year, and approximately once every 15 years, a very large destructive tsunami strikes. You may be asking then, what made this particular earthquake and subsequent tsunami just so deadly? 
and how can this be prevented in the future? One reason is the close proximity of the earthquake to land and the extreme speeds at which a tsunami moves. The hypocenter of the earthquake was approximately 160 kilometers off the western coast of northern Sumatra within the Indian Ocean. Just 20 minutes after the earthquake occurred, the first waves were arriving at the northern tip of Sumatra, instantly killing nearly 100,000 people. Then, an hour and a half later, the waves hit Thailand, resulting in similar death and destruction. These waves continue to expand outward from the epicenter of the earthquake at a rate of about 500 miles per hour, or about the speed of a commercial jetliner, hitting all of the surrounding landmasses and bringing with it extreme amounts of destruction. The second and related reason as to why the tsunami was so destructive was that despite having some amount of time, although limited, between when the initial earthquake occurred and when the tsunami arrived, many of the countries hit by the tsunami were completely taken by surprise. When the scripture puts this contrast with the first declaration of faith, saying that uh, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear, and immediately follows after with this picture of an awesome force, the earth being moved. We, we saw how it was the Burma plate and the Indian plate, the movement of those earth, as it were, created this wave and the mountains, uh, uh, the wave of the tsunami and the waters roar. Now, this is just a little sample of what's happening, uh, what happened in the 2004 tsunami. What happened was that there was unleashed a great force and power, which is so awesome. And in the recent days, there's a different kind of force that's been released, which is not the force of water, but we've seen the power of that little virus and how uh, it has killed even more people than the 2004 tsunami, right? In America itself alone, I think by now 250,000 people have died through that virus. Now, these are shakings in this earth which will continue. It will not stop. And so, men's heart will fail them, and we will be fearful. But how do we prepare ourselves for situations that are going to be so challenging? Some, the psalmist just say, declare with a faith in us that God is our refuge and God is our strength. A refuge means it's a place where we can come in and find shelter. So when God is our refuge, we can find shelter in God. When God is our strength, He provides us with the strength to overcome any challenges in life. And the next thing He says is that He's a very present help. That means in times of trouble, in trouble, He's a present help. So when we want to be sure that we're going to be unshakable in the kingdom of God, the first point I want you to learn from Psalms 46 is the, power, the declaration of faith, right? Now, the second, Psalms 46 verses 4 to 7, let me just tell you. After saying about God become, uh, being our uh, refuge and strength, it shifts direction and begins to say, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in her midst, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations rage, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted, and the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Oh, by the way, before that, no? Immediately, I, I didn't put it down there, but uh, if you look at the previous uh, slide here, all right, immediately after all these things, uh, there is this sentence, or there is this word called Selah. In fact, immediately after the three, um, what do you call it, the three points that is illust illustrated in this particular uh, uh, Psalms, there is this word, Selah. 
And we're going to dwell on it at the end. The fourth thing, the power of Selah. And it literally means to stop, to pause and think. So, uh, we pause and think, all right? So, I want to move you forward now. All right? There is a river whose stream make glad the city of God. What is this river? And I want to uh, explain to you that this river refers and speak of the Holy Spirit. So the second thing for us to ensure that our hearts are not shaken is the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to bring you through verses. And uh, it says that there's a river whose stream make glad the city of God. All right? So this is the joy of the Spirit. Now, if we are going to remain unshakable in the midst of trouble, not only do we need to make declarations of faith, number two, we have to have that gladness of the river of God flowing through our lives. The joy that is there because of the Spirit. Because the Scripture says the joy of the Lord gives us strength. So, what do we learn about this river of God? Number one, it is supernatural. Because its streams make glad the city of God. Remember, last week, we talked about having come to Zion and to the city of the living God. And so, in this Psalms, when he moved on to the, describing the river and his, who has streams that make glad the city of God, he's speaking about something supernatural. The city of God is the place where God is, the church, Mount Zion, where we dwell in, the unshaped unshakable kingdom and in that unshakable kingdom there is a river there is a river that makes uh, whose streams uh, make glad the city of god in other words god has given us a provision not just only of the word of god that enables us to know how to stay in his shelter and in his refuge but he's given us a person the holy spirit who comes into our life and because it comes into our life it creates streams of that will make us glad glad in the lord the joy of the lord and being strong you know when things are tiresome worrisome and wearing us down my own experience is that when i come into the presence of the holy spirit i find when the joy of god comes into my life then everything else disappears and move on. So I just want you to remind you of this Zion, the city of God. Last week, we put this slide up for you. He says that you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So we have not come to Mount Sinai, uh, but we've come to Mount Zion. We've come to the church of the living God. And in that city, the city, the Mount Zion, there is a stream that flows through, making glad those people and dwell in that. But the sad thing is, for many of us is that many of us have not developed that relationship with that river we have not learned to step into the river and and uh, begin to uh, walk in the in the anointing and in the flow of the river so let me just take you through some scripture verses and let's see how uh, the river of god is spoken of in the in the scripture first of all jesus said this in john chapter 7 verses 39 to uh, 37 to 10, 39. He says that on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him should would receive. For this Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You know, God has a river running through the whole of Bible. When, when man was put in the Garden of Eden, in Eden, there was a river that flows through and uh, brought life. 
the river Euphrates, as it was mentioned in Genesis, and it divided into four streams, and it brought, and it has gold, there's precious stone, and it brings uh, joy, it brings life and provision. So from there on until Revelation, we see this river uh, being constantly mentioned by God, that there's a provision in the city of God for people to have the joy of the Lord and to be able to overcome every challenge of life. I don't care uh, how terrible things may be and how challenging life may be, but the point is that when we swim in that river of God, when we dwell in this Holy Spirit, everything changes in a moment. Now, this week, I've had to have the challenge of praying much in the spirit, of really learning to, uh, uh, of really tr uh, dwelling in the spirit. Uh, my heart was burdened, and uh, I was praying. And uh, you know, when you pray in understanding, very often uh, you run out of words to pray. But I remember that I would lie down uh, over the week. I lie down and I pray in the spirit uh, softly, uh, so as not to disturb. Uh, Ming Eng, I'll be praying in the spirit, and then uh, what happened would be that I fall asleep, and then when I wake up, I'll be praying. I'll pray again in the spirit because uh, something troubled me within, and I was burdened. But as I continued to pray, but there was one particular day when I prayed in the spirit, and I just knew that the victory has been won, and uh, I entered into a peace and into a joy that from then on, even though I continued to pray in the Spirit for what God wanted me to pray for, but I knew that I had come into a place of victory. Brothers and sisters, I long for you and for every one of us in the church to learn how to swim in that river of God. You see, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He has given to us the stream of living waters that flow from deep within us. And as it flows up from within us, it will bring the joy of God. And He actually said in this verse, those who believe in Him would receive the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, this river is mentioned off in the New Testament. But I want to trace you through... Uh, two occasions in which the river of God is mentioned in relation to the temple. First of all, I want to refer you to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47 is a prophetic word about the millennium, uh, the third temple, right, that, that we are all looking for before Christ comes back the uh, establishment of the third temple. And that temple will be in the millennium. And this is what it says about the temple. It says, the healing waters and trees. He brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. And he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faced east. And there was water running out on the right side. Now this is describing that in that temple, there was water flowing out through the door of the temple. And it is a picture of that river that God has given to, uh, given to us and given to his people. And the next thing was this angel, this man, went out to the east with a line in his hand and he measured 1,000 cubits, that's a measurement, and he brought me through the waters. And see how the waters increase in depth. Huh? The water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 cubits. He brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000 and it was a river that I could not cross for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim. A river that could not be crossed. This river of God speaks about the flow of the Spirit of God as it flows out from the temple. And it's an experience for each one of us. You know, uh, it's our choice how deep we want to come into the Spirit. It starts with just the ankle. You can, you can at the beginning, be a, a little bit cautious. You step and, 
and uh, dip your feet into the water and you start to be, you start to frequent, uh, familiarize yourself with the things of the Spirit and you go in just ankle deep. But God's saying to us, there's more. You, need, you can go in further and go into up to your knees. It's up to you, right? And then you can go further up to your waist and then after that, over you so that you cannot cross it and you have to swim. And I want to share with you a testimony when God gave me a dream uh, many years back when uh, my family were, well, we were in Brisbane for a time of training. And my desire at the time was that I might learn to move in the things of the Spirit. And so in, lear in trying to learn the things of the Spirit, uh, we went to this school uh, of the Spirit uh, that was uh, led by Clark Taylor, one of the pioneers in moving in the things of the Spirit. And I remember we went through the six week and uh, I learned how to pray and how to seek the Lord. And after that, we decided uh, God wants us to stay back. And so for the first month after the school, uh, we went first to Sydney, then we came back and we stayed in uh, the Caravan Park, Sheldon Caravan Park in Brisbane. And I was seeking the face of the Lord in trying to understand the ways of the Spirit. I wake up early in the morning in the, in the little caravan and it was getting colder and colder. And, uh, you know, one of the ways I tried to keep warm was to, uh, open, uh, uh, to turn on the oven uh, and open the door, hoping that the heat would come up and keep me a little bit warmer. But it was cold and I was praying and I was seeking the Lord. And the Lord knows the desire of my heart as to what I wanted to uh, learn, how to move in the things of the Spirit. And I remember one morning, now I, I have this, I think the way God speaks to me, uh, it has been quite consistent. It's always uh, in the early mornings uh, uh, between the uh, waking up and you're half awake, half asleep, that a clear vision comes across into, uh, into my mind. And what I saw was in this dream was that I was riding on a motorbike. I was actually a pillion rider behind somebody on the motorbike. And uh, the motorbike was going into the river, a river. And as I went into the river, you know, it was like that, what was described here, ankle deep. That means it's slowly the, the motorbike was going further and further and further. And I was riding behind that person who was driving the motorbike. And finally, we came into the deepest part of the river. And what happened was that the whole motorbike was swept away. And there I was in the river. And there I was swimming. And uh, the word of the Lord came to me was that when I start, when I start to move in the things of the Spirit, I would have to ride on other people's experience and begin to step into the depths of the water. And as I begin to step in through this motorbike, then finally what happened is that as I go deeper and deeper and deeper, one day it will be, the motorbike will be overturned and then I will be swimming in that river. And the Lord's promise to me would be that I would begin to move in the things of the Spirit according to the anointing He has given me. And my challenge in brand sisters, this river that has, whose streams make glad the city of God uh, can be just words for you. But I want to encourage you to step into that river. All right? It continues to say, yeah? it continues to say, he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned, there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the uh, wherever the river goes now 
There's another prophetic word somewhere in the scripture that says that uh, towards the end of time when Christ comes, there's going to be a major earthquake in Jerusalem, and there will be, uh, and it will split into two, the mountain of Mount Olive will be split into two, then the river will flow through, and the river will flow and bring life, all right? bring life and that bright, uh, and it will bring life even into the Dead Sea. So there's a prophetic word that the Dead Sea will come alive again. And this is, this is a picture. During the millennium period, from this temple, physical water is going to come through and it will make alive the Dead Sea. And that speaks to us spiritually that when this water of the river of God flows through the church, the city of God, Mount Zion, through us, it's Power is such that it will make glad the city. It will flow through. God will be in the midst and the city shall not be moved. And God will be her very, uh, will help her. Uh, just at the break of dawn, we read those scriptures there. And so we're looking at a spiritual aspect of this river, the supernatural river that God has made available for you and for me in the church is that if we can, step into that river it can bring life it can bring uh, into our uh, uh, life into uh, the parts of our body that is uh, into our spiritual life that is dead and the final part of this verse says it shall be the fishermen will stand by it from Engedi to en Eglame there will be places they will be places for spreading the nets the fish will be of the same kind as the fish of the great sea that is the mediterranean eh? exceedingly many but the swamps and marshes will not be healed they will be given over to salt the dead sea itself will come alive but surrounding region itself will not be healed during that time along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. And their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit, their fruit will be food for will be for food, and their leaves for medicine. Right? So what a tremendous picture of this river from the storm the waves, uh, mountain shaking, and asking us to declare that God is our refuge. The picture changed and say that where we are in the city of Zion, in the city of the living God, there is a river. So as I can suggest to you, the second thing that's going to make the scripture come alive to us is when we learn to understand the Holy Spirit and move in it. Now there's another scripture verse about the same river, and this is after the millennium. See, the millennium is a thousand years. There will be the river that flows through. But then in the millennium, in, uh, the, uh, in the new Jerusalem, Ch uh, Revelation 22 verses 1 to 2, there's the river of life again mentioned. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of his street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, right? So in the city of God, in the church of Jesus Christ, in your heart, in my heart, there's a river that flows. We must get to know the Holy Spirit. We must get to develop that relationship. You have to take the time because when things shake on earth and you take the time now to deliver, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, get to know the Spirit and to live within the Spirit, then what happens is that God's going to be in your midst and you shall not be moved, all right? God will help her just at the break of dawn. Now, when the New King James say, just at the break of dawn, we get the idea that we're going to go through the night and then only in the dawn, morning, so it will come. But there's another translation. He says, God shall help her and that right early. In other words, God will step in and help immediately. And when the nations rage, kingdoms are moved, God has only got to speak His word and the earth melts. So what an awesome God we have. The spirit of the living God that God has given to us. Let us not take him for granted. And this is the verse that will encourage you because when the spirit of God comes into your life, 
John 7 verses 25 to 27. And when you learn to swim in the Spirit, he says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you. That's Jesus. Huh? But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the Holy Spirit is going to establish the peace in our heart. So that's the second part of the uh, psalm where he says to us to, that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God and how we need not be fearful. And interestingly, following this second point, there is a verse in verse 7, which will be repeated later, which says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. So what is the scripture telling us? Who is the God, the Lord of hosts? That's the sovereign God who is host of all the angels. Who is the God of Jacob? That's our personal God. Who is our personal God? So both the awesome God and our personal God, He is our refuge, He is with us. So take time to think and reflect on that. Now, the third thing that we want to look at is that uh, now is from uh, verse 46 onwards. Uh, the third point is that spiritual sight or vision is very important, okay? It can bring us stability in our life, all right? So, so far, declarations of faith, the person of the Holy Spirit, and third, spiritual sight, vision, because it can bring us stability. All right? And so let's read this verse. The remaining part of Psalms 46, verse 8 to 11 says, Come, behold the works of God. So we are told that in the world that is shaking uh, with all the, uh, the seas uh, roaring and uh, nations raging, as we see in the earlier two verses, the Lord says to us, Come and behold the work of God. Who made desolations in the earth? He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Then he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This final part is telling us have a look into the spirit realm. Open the eyes of the spirit and know the spiritual reality of the end. And the end is that as we behold what God's doing in this world, we can see desolations, no doubt, but you need to understand the scripture is saying that God is going to cause wars to cease to the ends of this earth. He's going to break the bows and cut the spears in two, all right? And then he tells us, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nation. I will be exalted in all the earth. What do you see today in the spirit? Like when the, uh, uh, when the, when the 12 uh, spies went into the promised land, what did they see? They saw the goodness of the land, but 10 of them saw the giants of the land. Two of them saw the beauty of the land from the eyes of God. So, in times of distress, in times of challenges of our spirit, we have to train our eyes to see spiritually, to see into the fulfillment that God is going to bring upon this earth and to be still and know that God is God. Behold the works of the Lord, all right? 
Behold his work. Behold what God's doing. We see wars. In fact, recently I've been watching news quite a bit because of the new smart TV I have. And it's been interesting to watch Al Jazeera, to watch CNA, and see the wars that's happening in so many different places. Ethiopia, the wars is happening in Ethiopia. The wars is happening in uh, wars happening in, uh, uh, in so many different places. I cannot even remember that, all right? And what happened is that. Uh, we are wondering, when will war cease? When will there be a ceasing of the wars? But let's stand on the scripture. Scripture says to us, to behold the works of God. God is working. God is at work. You may not see it in the natural now. What we see is wars and pandemics and tsunamis and problems. But God is at work. And when we see that, when we know the future, when we know the end, it gives us stability, right? When we know that at the end, wars are going to cease, at the end, God's going to be exalted in all the nation, then we know that uh, we can be stable in our faith today, all right? So, I want you to look at this. Uh, what the scripture is telling us is that we need to look at the land of this majestic king. And there's a scripture verse that says here, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. All right, that's a far off. Right now, it seems so far off. The land of the majestic king, the awesome God, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we don't see it now on earth. But the scripture says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty in that day. But let's train our spiritual eyes to look into the future, to look into the end. So you, you can see these three things that Scripture talks to us about, right? Number one, declare the Word of God. Number two, the empowering of the Holy Spirit to give us joy. Number three is the... Uh, uh, the sight of the future, the spiritual insight into the future. If we can get these things going on, we can take the scriptures and it can become part of us. And so that's why when Hebrews 11 spoke about the man of God uh, in those chapter there, in the chapter there, and we see that Abraham was looking for a city, you know, not on earth, but a city that was built by God. A city that's not with the foundation of man, but with the foundation of God. So, this message is actually a very simple message. It's a simple message just tells us that God is our refuge and our strength. So, therefore, and a present help in times of trouble, therefore, we are not to fear. But to make it a reality, you have to swim in the Spirit. You have to declare it constantly. You have to allow the Spirit of God to give you joy. And you've got to allow the Spirit of God to give you the words uh, to bring to your remembrance the Scripture, all right? Bring to your remembrance the Scripture that tells us that Jesus has told us about the end. And when we do that, our hearts are stabilized. You may say, Pastor, is that so simple? It's not really that simple, all right? But it can be possible. It's whether you want to develop that in your life. When you and I develop that, making declarations on the Word of God, allowing the Holy Spirit to give us the joy, and then allowing the Holy Spirit to paint the picture of the end to come, we can be men and women that will stand as giants in the land. And we will, because we are secure and unshakable, many people around us will look to us, will come to us for an understanding of that faith you have, for an understanding of how you can be unshaken even though the greatest trouble comes. And so finally, the last part. You see, after every segment, there's this word, Selah. 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 So the power of Selah is actually the power of meditation, meditating on His Word. So if you take the scripture, which I did, 
you know, in preparing for this uh, message, the first thing I do in preparing is that I learn the story. I remember it from beginning to the end, right? The Lord is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And uh, uh, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, right? Uh, and its waters roar and be troubled. And uh, waters roar and be troubled. And uh, yeah, I've forgotten in the midst of the whole thing. Yeah? And uh, the mountain shakes with fear. Set up. There is a river whose streams make the city of God glad. And God is in her midst and she shall not be shaken. God will come to her help just at the break of dawn. The nations rage and the kingdoms are, uh, uh, are shaken. The Lord utters His voice and the earth is and the earth melts. And then he come and say, the Lord of hosts is with us and uh, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Again, Selah. Meditate, meditate. All right? And uh, these are important things it teaches us to meditate. So, as I conclude this message today, uh, I just want us to remember that nothing in the realm of the Spirit comes easy. We had to pay the price. I had to pay the price, the price of uh, seeking the face of the Lord, learning how to move in the things of the Spirit, learning His Word, learning how to train my spiritual sight to see the things of God even before they come to pass. And you can do the same, brothers and sisters. Where you are this morning as you listen, you can do the same. Let me encourage you. You can be a man who knows how to declare God's word. You can be a man or a woman who has the joy of the Holy Spirit because you are moving in the things of God, swimming in the river. And you can be a man or woman who has trained her spiritual sight to look ahead into the promises that God has said. And you can see that God is exalted over the nation and God is going to be exalted over the earth as well. And may God make you a student of God's Word, a pursuer of His Spirit, and a meditator. Someone who will meditate and stop. So when you read the Scripture, don't just rush through, right? And when you, you can do the STS way, learn the story, stop. Selah. Pause. Reflect. Think. What's God saying here? Holy Spirit, how can you make it come alive to me? And may God bless you this morning with the ability to take things further in your life. Move in the things of the Spirit. Don't let Satan rob you of your heritage. That river is given for you and for me. Don't let Satan rob it. Don't let Satan take away the joy of our life because that will give us stability in the days ahead. So let me lead, uh, close in the word of prayer, and uh, may God bless you. Lord, we thank you that to this morning we can come into your presence, and uh, we can drink of your Spirit of God, we can worship you. And Father, we pray that even as we look unto you, Lord, uh, the author and the finisher of our faith, I pray that each one of us will become matured men and women of God, mighty men of God and women of God, and that our lives will be a glorious testimony of who you are, that you are our refuge and you are our strength, a very present help in trouble. Father, I thank you. I ask you to bless each one of us in the week ahead of us, and may we demonstrate the grace of God, the goodness of God to our neighbors, and to our relatives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.